then in 1995, I was working in a music store with someone, it was actually Sarah Evans, and it was before she went to Nashville and became a country music star. And I worked at a music store, it's called Incredible Universe. It was a large electronics store and they had a music section, an electronics section, large appliance section, that sort of thing. So, um, always watching me from the other store, there's sort of a gateway and window or whatever between the electronics store and the music store was a man named Mike Nichols. And he had a friend with him who I insulted, I think, one time when I said something about his being Jewish. And I couldn't remember for the longest time, did I say something about Jesuit or did I say something about Jewish? And I don't believe there's anything about Jesuit because I really had no... concern about, or maybe even not really any knowledge about what Jesuit meant. I knew that Robin Bechtel's best friend, Eric Lund, went to a Jesuit school, and that was the most that I'd heard of that. So I think that it was something about Jewish, possibly. But I think it was just probably an off-cuff, uh, off very um, naive remark. But I could tell that it really upset him, and I didn't know why, the person who was friends with Mike Nichols. So then the next thing that happened is, I was asking everyone, I was going to Nashville, I invited anyone and everyone to go with me, you know, if they wanted to share gas or just go along with me and my friend Monica on this road trip. So I hadn't told anyone that my friend Monica was going to go along, it was just going to be me. And then Mike Nichols said that he would go. So he was saying he would go on this trip with me and just drop everything, his job, everything. And then after he said he'd go, I asked my friend Monica to go with me because I didn't feel comfortable going with just a man. So she said that she would go with with us and it was going to be sort of an adventure I thought and then I started having sort of a bad feeling about it like something was wrong and I felt that way on the first day before we left and felt like something is definitely wrong but I can't back out I mean it was all set up everything was ready to go and everyone had packed had quit their jobs I didn't know how I could say, I didn't know how I could back out, but I had a very strong feeling that something was definitely wrong. So then, by the second day of the trip, we were driving and I asked Mike to pull over because I thought he was getting tired and it was just he'd been driving. We had an agreement before we ever began to drive. I said, these are the rules. Each of us takes turns driving. We drive no longer. Each of us drives no longer than, you know, such and such amount of time. And no one is allowed to go over 70 miles an hour. And that was my, that was my rule. I felt that it was a keeping everyone's best interests in mind, and it was my car, and that's what I chose as a rule, and 70 miles an hour was in only an extreme, like if it was a flat road, and it was a highway, and that was just like kind of max. So everyone agreed to this, and then on the second day when I asked Mike to pull over because he'd been driving longer than than his um, than he should have been, I thought. And I think just because I felt like I wanted to drive, I was feeling like I wanted to drive. I asked him to pull over and he refused to pull over and just kept driving. And I said, Mike, I I, I need you to pull over because I want to drive and he just ignored me. And I said, Mike, this is, this is my car. I said, 
will you please pull over so that I can drive? And he ignored me and just kept driving. I am not kidding, he did this for about a half an hour, and I didn't really know what, how to respond to that. I mean, he was the one behind the wheel. I couldn't do anything about that. And then he, then he made a couple comments about, no, I'm fine, I, I can drive, but I said, well, I want you to pull over anyway. And he still refused. So then at that point, I started having a bad feeling again, and I told my friend Monica, I said, I think we should pray. And then I asked Mike if he wanted to pray with me, and he said no. And he just had this hard look to his face. Like his jaw was set, and a very hard expression. And at that time, and even after the accident, which then happened, occurred, when I talked about things with people, I never referred to it as, you know, when Mike hijacked my car. But essentially, I mean, I didn't really know what a hijacking was, but essentially that's what he did. He basically hijacked my car. <sighs> and then, I a little bit later, I said, okay, drive safely, beca safely because, so my friend Monica and I prayed, and then I said, drive safely because I'm going to get some cookies um, from the other side of the car, which were near the floor of the car, and I didn't think I could reach them without my seatbelt on. I said, I'm going to take my seatbelt off. So I announced I was taking my seatbelt off and to drive safely. And then I either took it off and put it right back on, or I never took it off and just leaned over and I was able to get the cookies. But as soon as I said that, then Monica did point to something outside of the window, but she was pointing to things outside of the window all day. And so she was looking off to the side. And it's possible that instead of just being distracted as to what was to the side, that Mike took the opportunity to then drive to the shoulder of the road and then jerk it back to flip the car. Why someone would do that, I don't know, but there have been instances of kamikaze drivers and what was in it for him or his family, I, I'm not sure. However, the fact that he refused to stop the car to begin with, I think, is, is a warning sign. So. He didn't do this until I said my seatbelt was off. And if my seatbelt was off and their seatbelts were on, I had their carbon roll rolled. Um, and it was, and my, if my seatbelt had been off, I probably would have been thrown from the car, just very badly damaged. So at any rate, then all the next thing I knew, he was, he started to go off the shoulder. I thought he was gonna go down to the field, down to the field below because there was no reason why he couldn't do that plenty of room and instead he jerked the wheel back and flipped the car and it rolled I remember hearing the sound of glass breaking on the first roll and and then the comment that was made constantly after it happened was it went further than the length of a football field so I was told that Mike died and I broke my neck. They had to bring in, the car was so crushed down from the top that they had to bring some sort of machinery over to take the rope off. And my friend Monica somehow managed to squeeze out. She had a broken foot. But then the paramedics arrived and the first thing they asked me was, did I have my seatbelt on? And people kept asking me that which Anyway, they life flighted me. I was in, we were in Nevada at the time. They life flighted me to the University of Utah Hospital in Salt Lake City. And also, incidentally, Mike Nichols was told me he was adopted. He said his biological parents were from Canada. And I I think that, well, I have some ideas about who his parents possibly are, but I believe that his family, the Nichols, is possibly also connected to the FBI in some way because of the way that this entire event was handled. 
and how I was treated as if I had done something wrong when I was the one who was a victim. And so then we were life lighted to I was life lighted to this hospital in Utah and that was nineteen this is May of nineteen ninety five. And they did a surgery, they said for, because they said I had a broken neck. And in that surgery, they took the opportunity to put, to implant me with microchips. And, of course, I never suspected such a thing. I noticed, I mean, I had time to wait in the hospital before they did the surgery, so I examined my entire face, I was conscious at that point. I checked my entire face, my neck, my ears, my throat, under my chin. You know, I wanted to know where I was bleeding, where I had any injuries. And I had no injuries or cuts anywhere on my face or neck, except for starting at my head, at my scalp, where I had a head injury. But there was nothing around my ears, nothing under my chin, nothing on my face. And I checked because I thought, oh my gosh, my, you know, what kind of damage has been done to me. And after the surgery, I remember checking again and, and wondering why I had an incision underneath my chin, which had nothing to do with my neck, and an incision by my ear, which had nothing to do with my neck. So, after that surgery, they, they that hospital, well, after that surgery, I was then flown back to Oregon and had follow-up care at the Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. So they did some CTs or just follow-up stuff and checked on me. And then, sorry if this is sort of boring, by the way, because I know I'm talking in a monotone and I'm just very tired. It's um, the third day of my fast and this is usually the day that I think I feel like the least energy when fasting. So after that happened, my mother told me that there was a nanny position. This was like three months later. <clears throat> And I was in a hard collar. They were going to put a halo on me to keep my head still, but they did a hard collar instead. So, after this surgery, I was told that I had to work for a woman named Mary, or what I was going to meet a man and a woman named Carl and Mary Del Balzo in Beaverton, Oregon. And when I met them for dinner, or for an early supper, they talked to my mother the entire time, and I think they asked me a couple questions like, what do you like to do, or how are you feeling? But that was about it. And the rest of the time, they were looking directly at my mother, and then they said, okay, she will start working. They started negotiating with my mom. And they said that I would begin working for them on a certain date. They didn't ask me. They didn't even look at me. No one asked me if I wanted to work for them. They just basically told my mother when I was working for them. So I got into the car with my mom, and the first thing I did was I got upset. I said they didn't even ask me, and no one asked me. I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was 21 years old, and people are dealing over me. 